admission of the president's direct uh, influence in the drafting of that statement mm -hmm. actually has political ramifications, Mike Barnacle. You know, yesterday there was a question whether it has, I mean, legal ramifications or not. And you had several experts that were d looked into, like, for instance, uh, the Valerie Plame investigation that says, that says prosecutors, when they see somebody lying publicly, even if it's to the press, they presume it's part of a bigger cover-up. Take, take a look. Peter's that in the if a prosecutor finds out that uh, subjects of an investigation are speaking to one another, it immediately makes their antenna go up, and they immediately uh, come to become very suspicious that there is uh, coaching going on, and that is basically obstruction of justice. If they're fashioning a story, if they're getting their story straight. When the principals have these conversations and the lawyers are involved, those conversations aren't privileged. And everybody on that uh, Air Force One that day, uh, coming back from the G20, is going to be interviewed by the special counsel. He's going to get the manifest from Air Force One, find out who was on the plane, and find out who was involved in these discussions. They're, then they're going to get all the calls to Air Force One are monitored, and, and there's a record of every call that goes in. So they'll know what numbers were called. They'll get the emails. Everybody involved in that uh, that whole episode is going to have to get uh, interviewed. And Mike, if I'm a prosecutor, the, the lies that I'm looking at specifically, I'm keying into Donald Trump lying about the statement, helping put the statement together. That's a lie to cover up the possible collusion of the Russians trying, the Russian government trying to help Donald Trump, or him believing the Russian government was going to help him out. And then Donald Trump actually using his position as president of the United States, where he went to the side and made sure no American was around him when he was talking to Vladimir Putin, to then come back and say, oh yeah, we, uh, we talked about adoption. Donald Trump trying to follow up with the lie that he drafted on the airplane to throw the special, the, the prosecutor and everybody else off the track. It's lie stacked on top of lie stacked on top of lie using a G20 summit and rushing off and making sure there's not another American around to verify it. And then coming out of that meeting and saying, okay, here's what happened and then reinforcing the lie. Hey, isn't it amazing Don Jr. was telling the truth because Putin was talking to me about adoption. Oh. It, it, it's a pretty simple landscape that we're looking at because in every instance that we've, met, that we've mentioned here today, whether it's Russia, whether it's the drafting of the statement on the plane, whatever it is, the source of conflict with the truth is the President of the United States. And that leads to an unbelievable burden on people like John Kelly or John Dowd, one of his lawyers. We showed the quote from John Dowd. Makes it tough. It makes it impossible to deal with a client, whether you're the chief of staff or whether you're a defense attorney, because the president of the United States is living in a world uh, where the message is basically Richard Pryor's so, message. So, you're going to believe me or you're lying eyes. So, <laughs> Willie, at some point, though, and I understand the burden Gravity everybody this? has, <laughs> uh, but let's strip this down and make this simple. It's just like I was saying on Air Force One. I'm sitting in Air Force One. They're about to put out a lie to the New York Times. I'm not going to, first of all, I'm not going to have my career go up in flames because somebody wants to be a liar. Secondly, I don't want Bob Mueller coming at me. So I say, I'm not going to be part of this. <laughs> General Kelly, the first time General Kelly's lied to, He's got to resign. He's got to go out, hold a press conference, say, I was lied to. I can't do my job if I'm working for a liar. And that's with all of these people, Sarah Huckabee Sanders, Jay Sekulow, John Dowd, all of these attorneys. You can't, you can't believe that Donald Trump's going to be president forever. Your reputation is what stays with you. And when you're dead and you're buried in the ground, do you want to be remembered is Donald Trump's bag man, or Donald, the person that allowed Donald Trump to lie.
Is that what you want written in your obituary? Well, that would be at best. Well, yes, Things Sarah. Things could get ugly. And to your point, Mika, Sarah Huckabee Sanders has a difficult job, but nobody's holding a gun to her head, forcing her to remain there. If she's told one thing, and she's, she knows as well as everybody what the truth is. She read the Washington Post yesterday. She knows that the President of the United States helped draft that. So for her to go out and have to tell contradicting stories, there's a huge group of people around the President of the United States who over the last two years have shown an absolute willingness to stay right at his side even when he's not telling the truth. He prides is loyalty. He wants people to be close to him. He and wants look what people that's to defend done his life. And people. many people have shown a willingness to do that. And look what it's done so far for some of the people who've been the most loyal to him. Let's see. Was it worth it for Sean Flynn. Spicer? Was it, worth, was, was it worth it for Sean Spicer, over, a guy that the we all mooch. knew and liked? And had a good reputation in Washington, D.C. Was it worth it for Sean Spicer to lie for six months for this guy? I'm How did it say, end obviously up? Obviously, we would all agree that, it, that it's not worth it. And but we, well, don't you think Sean might agree that it wasn't worth it, too? I, I never underestimate the uh, capacity of, of humans to be able to rationalize weird behavior. The thing that should scare the hell out of the president is, he, is they try to bully Mueller. Yesterday, he hired his 16th lawyer. Mm. He hired a guy who has expertise in what? illegal foreign bribes like so as they're, they're saying hey stop this stuff stop this stuff there he the, the, the investigation's getting wider it's getting yeah. bigger it's getting more forceful so all of these the, the things yeah. that we pull at each day imagine all the things that they're pulling at oh, and that's gosh. why if that's wrapped. just what and, we and can the, see and the people we're talking about who are affected by being around him who are working for him they're all going to have to get lawyered up they're yeah. all going to have to be well, paying lawyers bills. I think at that was really expense. the point. Yes. Yes. And at their expense. Nobody's going to defend them when Trump and is not course, president. And of course, Trump's lawyer about a month ago went around telling everybody, you don't need a lawyer, you don't need a lawyer. The guy should be disbarred for that. <gasps> um, he's out now. He should. <laughs> should oh be disbarred gosh. for that. Um, so, so, Noah, let's talk about the consequences of this. And we're seeing it unfold on Capitol Hill every day. We were asking, you've been asking, I've been asking, a lot of Republicans, a lot of conservatives have been asking, how far are these members going to allow the president to push them? It looks like we're getting to a breaking point. We had Jeff Flake, of course, Lindsey Graham, uh, John McCain, of course, as always. But you even get, have people working for the president, the DEA. You've got the Boy Scouts leaders. You've got Goodness cops across gracious. America. You've got the cops that he spoke Everywhere to. Everywhere he, he goes. Rough them up. It looks like people are starting to push back. Why is this significant? Because maybe two or three months ago, Jeff Sessions would have quit after feeling the pressure from the president. Doesn't feel the pressure from the president anymore. And we're hearing more and more you fire Bob Mueller, you've got much bigger problems on your hands. Talk about the impact of all of these lies on the Republicans who actually will have a say on what happens with Bob Mueller. Right, well you saw uh, Lindsey Graham and Charles Grassley send a brushback pitch toward the White House when he started getting really aggressive with the Mueller probe. Uh, Joni Ernst, among others, attacking the uh, quote, ban on transgenders in the military. Members of, uh, of the Republican Senate conference are all over the Washington Post and New York Times today talking about how we're moving on despite the president's recommendations that we continue moving on with health care, that we're going in another direction. This is a weak presidency. Uh, and you're starting to see Republicans beginning to test the waters a little bit, see how much distance they can create from this president. Regardless of how the base feels, they're, they're continually frustrated with the fact that they can't really create too much distance from this president without angering their base. But they're doing it now anyway. And uh, I'm not entirely sure that that's such a bad move, especially when we've been talking about all these <laughs> issues with this president and his credibility is on the line. Uh, Republicans like Jeff Flake have been critical of this president since the beginning, but others, others are starting to join him a little bit. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, that's a, that's a grand experiment to see how uh, independent you know, the Republican Party I, is. I the found president. out firsthand, Jim, yeah. and you were there when it was happening, there were about 11 of us that went after Newt Gingrich when Newt started talking about not doing the tax cuts, when the appropriation bills got bigger, when they started saying, wait a second, maybe not term limits for speakers and maybe not term limits for all of these things that happened. And Newt was extraordinarily popular in my district. It only helped me. It only helped. You go out and say, listen, I know you like the guy, but let me tell you what's happening in Washington and why I have to do what I have to do. It was a win, win, win. But let's, but and yes. Flake will All. find that, by the way, in Arizona. Flake will find that, but let's not get carried away. The people who are standing up to the president right now are the people who 
have often been outspoken against Trump. There's not a whole lot of profiles and courage happening on Capitol Hill. Most Republicans don't like him, but they don't say a darn thing because the base still likes Donald Trump. So until that breaks, and, and I think it will at some point break if he continues on this pattern, that's when he has a serious problem. But most Republicans here on Capitol Hill, they still play the same stupid game and say privately, I don't like him. What the hell is he doing? Those tweets are, are moronic. And then, oh, you know, I don't know. Hopefully, uh, we don't want to around. talk about. We're, a, yeah. we're about to have a big debate on tax code reform, right? The president went out and he t attacked the House bill as being mean and needs more money and needs more heart. Now he's all over the news saying, you know, we should tax the rich. What, are Republicans really convinced that this guy's going to help sell a pro-growth tax package? I don't know how you believe a word he says you, you, if you're you know, a Republican. You know what's interesting about this conversation right here, this particular conversation, is that the, tra the reversal of the transgender policy, he does it by tweet, right? No one knows that he's doing it. He does it right. by tweet. Within hours, and it got some, it got some news uh, value in it. There was some publicity about it, but not a whole lot. Joe Dunford, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs mm. of Staff, the same day comes out and says, you know, oh, no, no, we're going to no. leave it the way it is. Okay. <laughs> I mean, that's like, official. wow. That is a big no. <laughs> yeah. Still ahead on yeah, Morning yeah, Joe, did yeah. the White yeah. House yeah. try and shape Shippy. one of the nastiest Ooh. and fakest news stories of oh, the year? this is sick. This is an incredible story. The kids call this sick. Just ahead, we're going to talk about the exploitation yeah. Sick. Yeah. of the death of Seth Rich. And, and, and reports coming out now that the president may have had a part in feeding that to Fox this News. This is getting bad. Also with us this morning, former New York City Mayor Mike Bloomberg. We're going to ask the billionaire if he will give us some of his money. Also, Senator Rob Portman. And Senate Democrat Claire McCaskill, who says there's actually a lot of bipartisan talk taking place on the Hill these days. And you guys know the group Heim? Yeah, yeah of course. Of course. Well, they like Joe's. They, they did a review. They like, I love We're going to show them. Pieces. They talk, and they're, and they're awesome. so cute. They're, they're not amazing. Yeah. The new Fleetwood Mac, they say. Oh, I, my gosh. Hi. You're still All right, we'll show you that. Block, coming. The kids love me. New kids on the block love me, too. Old kids. Old kids. Old kids. <laughs> Thanks for checking out MSNBC on YouTube, and make sure you subscribe to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories, and you can click on any of the videos around us to watch more for Morning Joe and MSNBC. Thanks so much for watching.